A match made in heaven. So, first of all, we're going to talk about, go ahead, next slide. We're going to talk a little bit about where did fitness come from? Where did this whole thing begin? And so fitness has a whole bunch of, you want to call it forefathers. Some of them maybe you're more familiar with, some of them perhaps you're not as familiar with. Uh, first of all, fitness was really a sort of a one-on-one -on -one thing. It was an individual thing. And we have a few pioneers within the fitness industry that actually brought it to the masses. Charles Atlas, which basically used his approach to challenge your manhood to get you excited about fitness. And the direct market for that, the audience, was really men. The fitness for females during this time was really not a very popular notion. As a matter of fact, uh, in previous generations, exercise, activity, being fit, or actually being active out in the open was really frowned upon for females. Jack LaLanne, of course you've heard of Jack LaLanne, who lived an incredibly long and functional life. He took the idea of what he did in fitness and brought it to media. He was the first one to actually have a show on television and actually started realizing fitness for everyone should be the direction that we go. And then finally, Richard Simmons. And one can look at Richard Simmons and kind of smile and have a little smirk about, well, what does he represent? And he's out there and he's alive, and he's, but he is inspiring. And that is one person, Richard Simmons, if I could tell you about what he has done for the fitness industry, is he's taken what people would not consider to be a fitness appropriate person, an overweight person, an obese person, and get them excited about starting something, even if it's just something related to dance. So we, we can thank these forefathers, these people who pioneered the bringing fitness to the masses. Next slide, please. So how did the fitness industry become so popular? When you look nowadays, you see fitness everywhere. You'd have to work pretty hard to not see a facility or a product or a trainer at a park or even pieces of equipment. And so today, we can look back and we can consider where are our roots when it comes to the popularity of fitness. First of all, it all really starts with the, the anecdotal evidence. Well, anecdotal evidence refers to people who look the part and we say, well, what did you do to look like that? And they say, I did this. And your answer is, then I will do that. They don't have any sort of background. They just happened to lift weights and accidentally got big or just realized I should run and now they're great at it. So there was nothing to back it up other than just here's what I've done. And of course, from that anecdotal evidence, and you can probably consider a lot of myths started being established from this kind of food helps you lose weight to this kind of exercise helps you, you know, lose this thing on the back of your arm. And so considering anecdotal evidence, although there's a lot of flaw in it, we can't ignore the fact that it is part of how the fitness business and the industry has become so big. The next part of it is as fitness, as exercise becomes more of a science, people want to find out why do people adapt? What are the changes that happen and how long do those changes take place? With that, more scientific uh, researchers started gathering their resources to research information, to investigate ideas from how a muscle contracts to why do you want to rest for this long? And all those things started contributing to the growth of the body of evidence we have in the science of fitness. And now, if you look at the credentials, you, you know, the letters on the back of a person's name, if they're a trainer or a fitness person, and we are now looking for letters, aren't we? We expect you have a certain body of education, a sort of academic background, in order for you to be considered reputable and credible. And then finally, winners. The perception of a person who has done it, look at them, how can I argue with that? And more importantly, I want to look like that. So oftentimes you will see people roaming around the gym who really don't know what they're doing, and they'll just start kind of following people who look really good. Well, that person has a nice rear end, so I guess I should probably do that same exercise with their rear end. Or that person has a really nice abdominal area, so I'll just do 4,000 abdominal crunches and hope that's going to go away. And so the perception of winners, and that's why you look at fitness and you look at, well, who are the role models? They're fit people, muscular, lean, good athletes. Well, as a, as a result of these three different areas, personalization started to slowly grow. So you got people who say, you know what, I've done this. I look like this, I have, now have science to support this, and now I can start creating and tailoring programs for that population. 
and then boom, facilities. Places you can actually go, seek professional assistance, and seek some sort of guidance, because when you walk into a gym, how many reps do you do? How many sets do you do? How long should I warm up? How long should I cool down? Should I just do this stretch? Why shouldn't I do that stretch? You know, what about my posture is so bad that I shouldn't do certain things? So personalization started to grow with the, the onset and the, the introduction of facilities. And the facilities had lots of different, uh, lots of different streams. So we had big box gyms, we call them, where you're talking thousands of members, hundreds of facilities all over the country or all over the world. And so, of course, obviously the idea here is bringing a lot more people to one location or to one company. And so they're able to help a lot more people. Then, of course, you have what we call the dry gyms. So a big box gym, you're talking about probably pools, showers, locker rooms, high-end places that cost a lot of money to, to even keep their doors open, which means obviously they need a whole lot of people or they're going to have to raise the prices to each person. A dry gym are your smaller places. I call them your mom and pop gyms. And so these are ones that would be like in strip malls that have a workout area, maybe a bathroom, and that's it. So no showers, no locker rooms, no pools. Keeps the cost low to try and attract more of the people that are closer by. Some of us will be more likely to have a place that's a one minute drive away versus driving 15 minutes to a huge three story resort fitness facility, which there are. And then finally, private studios. It wasn't enough for me to just go into a gym and have a membership, but I also need some help. And so I need a little bit more attention. And how do I do that? Going to maybe a facility that only offers a membership based upon buying services. So you can only come to our facility if you're gonna be working with one of our professional staff. So you can see how the personalization side of it from facility standpoint started to grow. And now people are expecting if I'm gonna get a membership, I need somebody to help me with that. Not just a membership and now suddenly I'm gonna wake up and be fit. And then of course, services. So talking about the personalization side of what facilities did, having the gym wasn't enough. Services that gyms were providing are really what the triggering points were to get people involved. An interesting note, uh, a big box gym years ago, a large chain, it's one of the largest in the world, actually did a survey of all of their membership. And what they found was people who just buy a membership tend to cancel within the first two months. They're done. People who at least get an orientation, a free orientation as part of your membership, they stick around for about a year. People who actually get personal training or some sort of services, they actually stay for over five years. And in those five years, they also find that those people end up spending more while they're there, besides purchasing services, purchasing products, and things like that. So if you are a facility, you can imagine, I want to provide services. So what are the services? One-on-one, -on -one, so I can work individually with a person. I know everything about them as much as they'll tell me, and I design programs based upon what they need. Buddy training, well, that started to slowly grow. So it started to realize, you know what, if I have one person here, maybe I'll have another person that can hold them accountable, and now as a trainer, I can make more money in one hour. Then of course you started getting small group type settings. You might see a lot of those now, where it's maybe between five to 10 people in one group. Well, from a business perspective, that's a great idea, because I can charge you less per person, but if I have enough people, I will end up making quadruple or even more than that per hour. So it's a good idea for the gym, and a better cost-effective idea for the consumer. And then finally, your large group settings. One of the most popular reasons why people go to a gym at all is group classes. They see more people in two hours than trainers often see in two months. And it's because there's a social side of it. And then with that, of course, you have different classes that will fit a person's need. If I have a class that's for you know, muscle gain, then they you can make classes for that. People who want cycling classes. So there are a lot of different ways to personalize that. But ultimately, the growth of the, in, of the fitness industry, this whole thing has been driven by one simple fact. Next slide. It's simply the fact that when we are trying to grow our business, we're trying to grow our desire. Next slide. I want to get better now. That's the whole reason why fitness has grown at all, because we're impatient. We want results yesterday. That's why the supplement industry is so popular, because if I can take a pill and not get on a treadmill, wow, that seems a whole lot easier for me. The treadmill's cheaper, I can go for a walk, walk my dog, but a pill's so much easier. And so we are in a, in a, in a satisfaction now type of men mentality. And so next slide. So because of that, technology started to really hit the market and hit the ground running. We started realizing 
that we can merge fitness and we can merge technology and help people target certain areas. Oh, well, you want to lose this? Well, we have a machine just for that. Now, obviously, if you're a fitness professional, you know that doesn't work. But, but that it's catering on the idea that I want results now. And so with that, we have machines now where I may not need a person to walk me around and show me how to do a very complex movement with a kettlebell or a dumbbell. Now I can have you sit down on a machine and have you just push, and it'll tell you exactly what to do. You adjust the seat until it's comfortable, and you just push. If that's too easy, drop the pin down and keep going. So you can see how the autonomy, now I don't need somebody necessarily to help me with that. But at the same time too, we can also make the argument that having those types of technologies from equipment to other types of things that we have now with different ways that you can train as far as different types of um, not big equipment like machines but smaller equipment like uh, medicine balls, kettlebells, things of that sort, that you can actually make your workouts much more effective. If I'm going to have you sit down on a bicep curl machine, you're going to feel it in your bicep. So now you're thinking to yourself, this is much more effective. So the autonomy side of it and the effective side of it. Man, fitness technology is a hit. What a great idea when we get these engineers that are coming in and actually saying, how can I make movement more effective? Next slide. So fitness is a hit, but if you take a look at the examples that we have here, you can also understand too, fitness technology has also been a miss in many ways as well. From ideas again, to think about what they're trying to promote for you. They're trying to send you a message. The first message is, I can get you results now. Second message is, I know you have problem spots. I'll get to those problem spots now. And oh, cost is a problem for you? Well, I'll get you those problem spots. I'll get them to you now and we'll make it as cheap as possible. As a matter of fact, you don't even you don't need to go to the gym. You don't need a trainer, don't go to the gym, don't even watch what you eat. Just buy this one item and that's all you need. Well, obviously, you take a look at some of our examples, the shake weight, you grab on, just sort of, that kind of thing. You know, one can say, hey, that works, that, it's really, really hard to do. Yeah, I agree. If you've never done it before, it will be really hard to do. Okay? And of course, you have uh, one of my personal favorites, a little more old school, the Thigh Master, which was all the rage. And at some point, it was in every, every mom's closet. Okay? And when your friends came over, you started playing around with it and throwing it across the room like a boomerang. And so the idea, again, was target an area and try to help to create these results on problem areas. Okay? The sauna suit, so a plastic sweatsuit. The idea is you're going to sweat a ton even while doing minimal activity and you're going to lose weight. Totally true. You will lose weight, but you're going to lose water. You're not going to lose fat. And so, and obviously your body needs to cool by evaporation and so you run a risk of, I don't know, death, that whole thing, which is one way to get less fit. Uh, and then the, one of my personal favorites is called the ab hanser and basically it looks like a grill and you wear it like a belt around you over your abs and the idea is it's going to compress your fat in a grid-like form so it looks like you have a washboard stomach. <laughs> That's good stuff right there. So you wear it under your clothes, then you go to the beach, you take it off in the car, then you strut with your shirt off and then you probably may want to take it with you in your bag so you can reevaluate your abs later on and put it back on later in the day. Uh, Vibration things or electric, electric stimulation things where you put electrodes on your body and that's going to help you lose the fat. And then of course you have these other types of weighted uh, apparatus that you would actually slip into and it adds some weight to your body which makes it harder to move around. And if it's harder to move around, you're going to burn more calories. You burn more calories, the idea is you'll lose more weight. So one of the things to consider in all of these things, and I, I mention this a lot when I lecture, is if those things actually worked, then there'd be no reason to do all the fitness stuff that we do every day. If I was, if, I, and if, if spot reducing, which is what most of these things are kind of calling to, spot reducing, trying to identify a target area, get rid of that fat over that area simply by training it. If that worked, then fat people would all have skinny faces. <coughs> Using those muscles, would cause a whole lot of muscular activity and they would be lean in the face. But we know that doesn't work. We know that's not true. So what we're gonna do now, next slide, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take 
the idea, you know about the fitness industry, you see how technology has slowly started to come into it and become more of a player. Now Rick is gonna take his expertise and he's gonna talk to you about how technology has really become a major driver for the fitness industry. Thanks, John. You're welcome. Oh, good idea. What else? What other tools do we have as fitness professionals in the gym? Okay, calipers, measure body fat. So now we start working out with a, with a client. What do we have then? Oh, wait. I ran three miles this morning. I got I to gotta share it on Facebook because it helps my friends get motivated to go run. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I'll just, it'll just take a second. Okay, got it. So what tools do we have in the gym as fitness professionals? They come, the client comes in, we tell them how many reps, how many sets to do, we count for them. Is that important? Okay, so we count for them, we tell them which exercises to do. We might talk a little bit about nutrition and give them basic guidelines on what to follow so that the client can come back in and tell us that they ate 1,000 calories less than what they actually ate. How, many, how much time do I get as a trainer working with a client? Okay, hour, how many days a week, maybe? Two, three times a week, maybe four, really motivated person. What about the other 23 hours of a day and the days when I'm not working with them? What tools do I have as a personal trainer in a gym to help my client? Okay, so prior, not counting the phone, let's take, take that out, take the technology of a phone out but generally speaking, not a whole lot. The education. We offer education and guidance to help them control those other 23 hours of the day. And that's the best we can hope for, but we have no idea to know what they're doing. So if about seven years ago, technology started making its way into the fitness world in a, in a different manner than what Jeff talked about. So we started off with activity monitors that were more than activity monitors. They gave you a calorie burn number. So you wear a device on your, somewhere on your body. It tracks all of your movement. Some devices measure the heat that your body dissipates. It tells you all sorts of information. One of the first things that happened then, Jeff and I experienced this, working with trainers and presenting this product, these types of products to them, one of their first reactions was, because it gave, it gave food guidance, nutritional guidance, it gave exercise guidance, and it tracked everything that you did. So you as a consumer could see what you were doing and what changes you needed to make right in your computer screen because the device was sending the data to the computer. So the, the tr typical trainer's response, a good percentage of those trainers would say, well, I don't want this tool. This is going back seven years now. I don't want this tool because why would they need me anymore if this is telling them what they need to do? They're not, I, I'm not going to sell this to them because then they don't need me. They're not going to depend on me anymore. When in reality, what's the benefit? Why would I want that tool? Why would I want something tracking my client 24 hours, seven days a week? Yeah. How else do I know what they're doing? So one of the things, the trends that we've seen, because the fitness industry at first was a little weird, leery of, of this these products coming into their, their place, into their place of business because they thought it was going to take away business. But health club trends for, for, this is going back two years, this is the last a survey two years ago, um, more people working out in clubs. So there's more and more people coming to the gym. And trend number six is technology. People in the gyms are using technology. If I use a tracker, some kind of a device that tracks what I do, and it tells me I need to do more. 
And maybe, maybe it tells me that I need to do more in certain areas of my body to build lean body mass or to improve my posture. Where is that going to send me if I'm the average consumer who doesn't know exercises? Where am I going to end up probably, hopefully? To a gym or a personal trainer, somewhere where somebody can give me some guidance. So the technology has done the opposite of what a lot of trainers thought it would do is in that it's brought people into the gym looking for guidance to say, how do I get to 10,000 steps? How do I get to improve my posture? How do I decrease my low back pain? You know, this has given me some tips, but I don't even understand what these tips are on my, on my phone or wherever, whatever I'm looking at. Next slide, please. So the typical trainer is going, their, their goal is primarily program design, is what we like to think of it as, and motivate our clients. As we talked about, educate our clients, keep clients accountable, and continually assess our clients' results. And through that assessment, we go back and we do more program design, change their program to get them better results and motivate. And now with fitness technology, we have an extra tool in our tool belt in the fitness industry. We can say, you have adapted to your workout program. I can see right here because in the past, step back for a second, in the past, if a client hit a plateau where they were losing, um, you know, they were losing a pound a week or two pounds a week for a couple months, and all of a sudden they started losing half of that, and then they started losing a quarter of that over a week, and then they just stopped losing weight after a month or two, after two months we'll say, completely stopped losing weight, plateaued. Well, you need to eat less, or you need to change your workout routine. Or, so you only had so many tools and so much information about what that client was doing to be able to have an impact. But now with technology, with client using these, clients using these tools, we can say specifically what they're doing. What's, where can I go? Okay, so I see that you've stopped going for a walk at lunchtime because you used to put in 1,000 steps or 1,500 steps at lunch, and lately there's only been 500 steps at lunch. So what's happening? Well, I can't do it anymore. We have a meeting, yada, yada, yada. Okay, let's shift. Let's do another walk at a different time in the day. Can you wake up 20 minutes early and go for a walk? Can you walk when you get home? So we have a new tool that we can actually visualize. We can see what our clients are doing. And the consumer themselves, once they're educated, can see this information as well. They can make ad adaptations to their program based on specific knowledge. There's data there showing them why they stopped getting results so we can change the program design. Motivation. Recently, this is a funny, in interesting story. I used to post a lot of my runs on Facebook when I was done. I stopped doing it because I thought it was kind of annoying to people. I had two different people within a week tell me, how come you stopped posting your runs on Facebook? I said, because I thought it was kind of annoying because I see other people doing it and I don't want to see it. I don't want to see theirs, so I thought I'm going to stop doing it. And they said, no, can you please do it? Because every time you did that, I would, it would motivate me to go out and try to beat your time or you know, go further than you did. So, okay, so I've started doing that again to 95% of the people that are my friends probably don't want to see it, but the 5% like it, so, so that's good. But these, this technology can be not just the Facebook, not just social media, but the, the, the products themselves can be motivating because it's a constant reminder. If you're wearing a device on your body, and it's telling, it's telling you you're only at, your goal is 10,000 steps and you go home from work and you're at 7,500, what might you do? Go for a run, go for a walk, take the dog for a walk, you might do something. So it gives you motivation to help you say, oh, I'm not, I'm not at my goal yet. I need to do something differently to get to my goal. And you, you know exactly why if you stay at 7,500 steps, eat dinner, go to bed, you know that day and in, in, in a week from now, you know why you probably didn't get the results you might have thought you were supposed to, because it's right in front of your face and you can't deny it anymore. Where in the past, trainers had to just say, well, I, be I bet you you're cheating on your food log. I bet you you're eating donuts for breakfast and you're not logging it. And you're calling your client a liar. Well, now the client, can, it's on themselves. It's on, it's on yourself to, to look at this and say, am I gonna log this donut if I eat it? Am I gonna lie to myself? and eat the donut and not log it? Am I gonna eat it and log it? You know what, I'm gonna eat it. And I'm gonna log it, and I'm gonna say, oh, guess what? I'm 400 calories over for the day, what I was supposed to eat. Tomorrow I might make a different decision. 
So it motivates you to make the right decision because it's in your face. All the information's there. How many steps, how much activity, all that information. It educates. That last example is, is an example of how it's practical application. It's education through doing. You're learning it because you're doing it and you're going through it and you're going, yeah, you know, my trainer used to say to me, you're not losing weight because you're eating too much. Well, now I'm logging my food and I'm being honest about it and I'm eating too much as compared to this device is telling me I moved this much and burned this many calories and I see I've, burned this many, I've eaten this many calories. Well, the ratio is off. I ate too much and moved too little. And that all goes to accountability. It's keeping you accountable. Now tie a program like this, an application or some kind of a technology that tracks your data, tie that in with a trainer and it's like double accountability. Because you're thinking twice every time you do something food-wise or exercise-wise, you're thinking about it and you're being held accountable by the device. And this is arguably one of the most powerful fitness technologies available, the phone, the iPhone or Andro Android phone, whatever phone you might have because of the number of tools it has within it and all of the fitness technologies, like all the pedometers and all the calorie trackers, they all work via Bluetooth to send data automatically to your phone. So all of the information is held right in here. But, so you're being held accountable by your device, your phone or device that you're wearing, and you have the ability to share that information with a trainer or with a doctor or with a dietitian or whoever you might be working with. So you're being held accountable by yourself because you're motivated to, and that information is going to someone else. And fitness tech, a lot of the fitness technology companies are working more and more with medical companies and sharing. So doctors who are on uh, electronic platforms and, and they're looking at patients' heart rate, uh, heart, yeah, resting heart rate and blood pressure and all this information, and they, they can be motivated to exercise more because a lot of these fitness technology companies are working with them to share data. So they're sharing data to these medical companies who can track how often you worked out. Well, your blood pressure's not going down. Are you exercising? Yeah, all the time. It's not in here. Why don't you wear this device for me? And we'll start uploading that data, and it'll share to this system, and we'll see it. Now the doctor has visu visual evidence when that patient works out. And then when you go to that assessment, you get different results during that assessment. Maybe you plateaued, maybe you didn't. You make changes as appropriate, and, and you learn a lot more so that when you do that assessment and then go back and try to change that program again, now you have different data. You're not just grasping at straws trying to figure out what's going wrong and why you're not getting the results you thought you were. Next slide. So here are the types of things, um, the different types of things that you have available the type of information that you can get. So, for example, um, minutes of activity you can, you can get um, through different tracking devices. The intensity of an activity. So what, what tool available, it's one of the, I would argue it's one of the first fitness technologies um, as far as performance, that, that track performance during a, a workout. Wear it here. Heart rate monitor. So a heart rate monitor is a, pro a great example of something that's been around a while. Uh, and it's becoming more and more popular. But it, it tracks the intensity of your activity. So you're not getting results walking. You wear a heart rate monitor. Oh, my heart rate only went from 70 to 85. I guess I'm not getting results because my target range from my trainer was 110 to 120 beats per minute. Oh, I see. I'm not working hard enough. Um, your resting heart rate is, is you know, there's a lot of devices now that you can wear that you wear all day, and it can just, it's just at, any, at a touch of a button, it can tell you your resting heart rate at that moment in time. So that's good feedback to tell you how fit you are. The, the lower your resting heart rate, the better condition you're in. Um, daily, I can't even read this. <laughs> you can edit this, right? <laughs> daily comparisons. So, when we are doing things on a day-to-day -day basis, and we can start knowing how we feel. So a lot, of, a lot of the systems, you can put like a smiley face, or a sad face, or a teary face, or you know, how are you feeling that day? And how can that be attributed to how you perform? So if you can get performance data about 
whatever, whatever you want to track. So whether it's tracking your food intake, whether it's tracking your exercise, you can get data and compare it day to day to day. And then you can look at it and say, well, how was I feeling that day? How many hours, you can track how many hours you sleep? How many hours did I sleep that night? Could that be why I was craving these foods? How, how much alcohol did I have the night before? Is that why I crave bacon and eggs the next morning? A little hangover, you know, whatever it is, you can look, you can keep track of your system. If you like journaling, it's all in there and the system can basically tell you why you felt that way on that particular day. Uh, blood pressure now, there's blood pressure machines now that are, are Wi-Fi. So now you can have your phone sitting wherever it is in your house. You wake up, take your blood pressure, goes through the Wi-Fi to your phone, boom, off to the doctor, potentially. So all this data is available. Um, our sedentary. So we, we focus on a lot on how much physical activity are you performing. As, as trainers in the fitness industry, well, how much, how much high intensity ex activity did you do? What other type of activity can be important in getting results? OK, so act, but activity-wise, uh, nutritional is obviously yeah, hugely important. But resting is important for recovery purposes. But what what, what's another type of activity outside of exercise where we're creating high intensity, getting the heart rate up? What other types of activities can benefit us in a weight loss goal? OK, stretching. Stretching is one. You're being, you're, when you're stretching, you're being active. Okay, recreational activities. Yes, OK, so that's a great, that's a really good one. So I get home from work, and I play with my kids by s opening up the iPad. <laughs> or do I walk to the park with my kids and play freeze tag with them? And we can even go lower than that. How about at your desk at work? The other seat's gone, so I can't use it as a prop. But people sit at work, and they sit for 8, 9, 12 hours. What else could you do? Could you get a desk like this and stand up? OK. Could you get a treadmill desk, a tread desk? They are available. You could get a bike desk. That's available as well. So you're sitting there, and you're just walking at 1, 2 miles an hour for the entire day. Or part of the day, you get tired, you sit down. But there's availability of things where you, ha you don't have to be completely sedentary. Even though we're tied, technology, essentially, fitness technology is technology to fight technology. Because technology is the re reason we have to be so sedentary. But we can battle, battle technology by using technology to be more active. Um, so we have these opportunities now to be more active, to stand up and do these types of things. Because one of the biggest problems, I mean, you can burn a ton of calories by standing and walking, instead of, take, instead of picking up the phone to the person down the hall, what can you do? Get up and walk. Don't send them an email. Get up. If you have a simple question, it's a one-sentence question, and it's probably a one-sentence answer. Get up, off your seat, go down the hall. And so now we can see with these devices that track your activity, they'll give you daily reports of how many hours of being sedentary you had in any, any given day. So how long did you sit? And it's, it's very different when you think about it that, oh yeah, I sat for a long time. But when you see a graph of showing you day by day by day, and then you see your weekend where sedentary time is like this, and then all week it's like this, and you start realizing, well, maybe that has something to do with me not getting results. Uh, number of steps, obviously, your total calorie burn, which is a great one to, to, to motivate you. Um, distance traveled, that's motivating. So with now with GPS devices, we get to see exactly where we went, how long it took us, how fast we were traveling when we did that. So they're not just great for the car, they're great for exercising as well, whether it's walking, jogging, cycling, all of those things. Exercise heart rate, we talked about that. Wi-Fi scale, so I touched on what the Wi-Fi idea, but why, you can wire your body pretty much that every morning you get up, you step on the scale, maybe it's a scale that does your body fat as well. So you get all that data, it just goes through your Wi-Fi to your phone, off to the cloud. So every single day, you can track your health parameters and see what kind of results you're getting. Is that motivating? If you know that every morning you're going to get up and you're going to see that you're not getting results doing what you're doing, might you change your routines? Probably. Hopefully. Hopefully you would. Or you're just going to throw the scale out and say, forget it. I'm turning off the Wi-Fi. Doesn't work. Next slide. 
So wearable technologies are you know, things that we're talking about now is, is you, you have on your phone. This is what I was talking about with the phone is it becomes so powerful. You have fitness apps that track your activity, whether it's cycling. Map My Fitness has apps called Map My Run, Map My Ride, whatever it is. It's, it's using your phone's GPS, and it's telling you how far you went and giving you a map of it. Some of the apps will give you um, on the course map that you ran, it'll, it'll tie in your heart rate data. So at a, at a part of the ride or run, when your heart rate got really high, it'll be red in that section. And then when it was really low, it'll be yellow or green or whatever colors they choose. But different apps use different colors and they'll actually show you on the route how high your heart rate was. Next time you do that same route, you can see if you've improved, if you've gotten stronger, if you can start pushing yourself harder. So it gives you that type of feedback. Uh, the next device next to it is a, is a calorie tracker act, or activity monitor. Um, it's, the device that it's showing is, is called body media device and it, it tracks your skin temperature, uh, all, all sorts of different measurements to give you an extremely accurate calorie burn number. You can also wear an activity monitor, you just clip on here. Now how is, that how is the, the activity monitors of today, like a Fitbit, how is that different than just wearing a pedometer and looking at it and going, oh, I burned 5,000 steps, or I, I took 5,000 steps. What's the difference? Uh, is, that, is anybody familiar with the Fitbits of the world, those products? Yeah, so the importance of sleep. So that it'll actually monitor with some level of accuracy based on movement. If you were moving around, it's gonna say you, you either weren't sleeping or you weren't in a deep, deep enough sleep and it'll tell you how much you're sleeping. Um, but it goes back to the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi. So this device, instead of just looking at it and going, oh, I took 5,000 steps. Now it sends it to the phone, sends it to the cloud, and then analyzes it for you, tells you how many steps you took, tell me how, to, about how many calories you burned, how far you traveled during those steps. It even has an altimeter, well, some of them have altimeters in it, so it tells you how, how high you traveled. Uh, so if you walked up a lot of steps, you'll get more credit than just walking across a floor because it knows that you are going up a higher elevation. So if you're running up a mountain, you're obviously gonna get credit for that and it's gonna calculate that into your calorie burn, into the amount of work that you did. Tie a heart rate monitor to it as well and you get that much more credit for it. So heart rate monitors are, are huge in terms of really monitoring your workouts and getting you where you need to go and tracking what you're doing. The last one is speed and cadence sensors. I mean, these things have come a long way for cyclists or for the average person who's doing just the spin class. Because the, you, typically, you do a spin class or you go, you go to the gym and, and do some kind of cycling class, and you're in there, and what, what tools do you have for feedback? Pretty much how your legs feel. I mean, you, you know, about, about how fast, you can look at the person next to you and go, oh, they're going faster than me, I'm gonna try to go faster. So let me turn down the intensity a little bit here and I'll go a little faster to try to catch up with them. Um, but is that really giving you the feedback you need to improve? So now there's tools on, on cycling, in, in cycling classes and different places on bikes on the road. There's tools that your phone becomes your co cycling computer. So you, tie, you put a speed and cadence sensor, a, a speed sensor on your wheel and a cadence sensor that tells you how fast your legs are going and it all sends the data to your phone and it tells you, okay, you're doing this many RPMs on your legs, you're going this fast, and your heart rate, because you're wearing a heart rate monitor also, your heart rate is this. Well, your heart rate's awfully low and your legs are going pretty slow, so why don't you go ahead a little, go a little faster, speed it up, or increase the intensity. And you can get the type of information like watts, like how much, how much power are you actually putting out when you're doing this, and you can set a target. And if you're below that target, push yourself harder. It's a lot different to see that kind of, see numbers in front of your face to push yourself than simply saying, well, that person's going faster than me next to me, so I guess I'll go a little faster. Because that's probably the right way to do it. Because they look better than me, so they're probably better at it, so I gotta do what they're doing. So, you start, so there's, a, there's a lot more data because of this. And tracking the progress is obviously important. Another one that, that uh, I've come across recently is um, very interesting. Uh, there's new scanning technologies that, you're, that you'll start seeing in gyms uh, soon. Some of you, actually, let me go back in time a little bit. Have you seen where you can do body fat testing? Where you, they put you in the dunk tank. They weigh you underwater because when you weigh, underwater, when you weigh yourself underwater, what, doesn't, what floats in your body? 
uh, you exhale completely, let's say there's no air in your body, what, what else floats? Fat. So you weigh yourself underwater, the difference between your land weight and your water weight is what? The amount of fat. So that's been around a while, uh, and they, they go around to gyms, and there's another one that's coming out that's a scanning technology, and you get into a booth, there's a couple different m versions, different companies, and it'll scan your body and give you a 3D visual of your body. So you can see your posture, you can see if your head, head's forward, your shoulders are rounded, you can tell what your hips look like, why you might have low back pain. You can actually see a 3D visual of yourself in there, and then you go in there every week or however often the gym sets it up, and you go in there, and you get another one done, and you see how many inches or centimeters or millimeters did your stomach shrink. Has your posture improved? Because your trainer took a look at your 3D scan and saw the rounded shoulders and created a program to help you stand up straighter. So now you get the next scan, let's see what's happening. Oh, you do look better. So the technology is coming into the gyms more and more to reinforce that what the trainers are doing and helping you do is helping or not helping for that matter, and you need to find another trainer or find some, another, another plan to get there. So trainers are gonna be held more and more accountable, and the fitness industry is gonna be held more and more accountable that their programs actually work because of technology telling consumers whether it's working or not. And being able to see, besides just the mirror, get real data on a daily basis that this is working or it's not working or it's easy for me or I have a lot of sad faces on the days that I work with my trainer. These types of things, this type of feedback is, is vital. Uh, next slide. So the top reasons that people do use, this is from uh, Consumer Electronics, um, Consumer Electronics, the CEA, Consumer Electronics Association, and they, they did a, a survey of why do people use fitness technologies. Number one reason was to monitor physical activity. So a, um, a pedometer, a calorie burn tracker, that type of thing. Motivation is number two. So people realize this, that this device, having this feedback, I have to be true to myself. And it's gonna motivate me to move. Or I'm gonna post this stuff on Facebook and I need to make sure that now that I've posted eight days in a row on whatever, or whatever social media you use, on this social media platform, I'm posting these workouts, and all of a sudden I stop, and people are gonna ask me, hey, how can you stop posting those workouts? Uh, well, kinda of don't do them anymore. And maybe you don't want that kind of feedback. Maybe you wanna be the person who's out there and you continue to, whether it annoys people or not, you continue to tell everybody what your workout was and how great you feel after your workout. And then they say, well, I feel like crap, and you always talk about how great you feel. Maybe I'll try working out. So it helps motivate that way too. Uh, tracking progress toward a goal. So obviously weight, body fat, uh, with the tools that are coming, the, the to, tools that we, we, there are tools that do look at posture as well. So whatever your goal is, there's a device out there to track. I want to lower resting heart rate. I want whatever it is, there's tool, these tools can give you that feedback. Uh, monitoring fitness measurements ties into progress, obviously. So those kind of tie together. Um, and making exercise more enjoyable. Because one of the things that I, and this is just my personal benefit, and it's the fifth one here, so there's a lot of people that feel that way. It's more fun to have some kind of a tool to tell you how fast you're going. It's, it's more fun to have a tool to tell you how fast you're running. So if I'm running and I say my goal is to stay under X minutes per mile, and I can look at it every 10 seconds if I want and see, am I, am I below my goal? So for an entire race, I know by the time I get to the next mile marker, I don't have to look at the time because I already know. I've been looking at it every 10 seconds. So it, makes, it can make exercise more enjoyable in that way as well. It's kind of fun, it becomes a game. You know, who moved who move the most? Com a lot of corporations are incorporating fitness this way, where you can have a competition, who moved the most? You know, ev everyone gets a, a calorie tracking device or a, mo a, a, a pedometer type device and we're gonna have a contest, who moves the most wins a prize. Who moves the most gets their health insurance paid for next month. Who moves the most, yeah, whatever it is, um, hel this helps them, it keeps it more fun, it makes it a contest, especially pe for people who are competitive, maybe they're competitive athletes in high school, and they don't have a, anything competitive anymore, and they go for a walk and they're bored out of their mind, 
you can create competitions with fitness technology because everybody can be on board on the, using the same tools. Next slide. So lack of motivation is the number one reason in surveys that people don't exercise. Do people typically know that it's good for them? Do they know that watching TV is not the best way to go about their free time? Do people know that Cheetos aren't the best choice? So we could say education is important, and education is vitally important. But at the heart of it, all the education in the world doesn't necessarily get somebody off the couch. So these tools are motivating in a way that they can keep, make it more fun and motivating to get engaged in ex exercise. So yeah, I know it's important, but I don't like it. Well, let's make it fun. Let's make it motivating. Let's make it challenging. Let's make it a competition. Now, how about that? Oh yeah, I'm very competitive. I'm very competitive in the corporate world. I'm, I'm all about you know, being the best. Well, all right, let's be the best at this now. And we're gonna, we're gonna measure it and we're gonna compete. We're gonna put you up against other people. You know, there's, there's interesting, there's an app, because this talk, that's a lot, of, a lot of people who are in the corporate world, they're just too busy and they're just, they're going after the dollar and they're very competitive. And if you just redirect their competitiveness to something like this, it's great. There's, a, there's a, an app called Strava. And if, if you're a cyclist or a runner, you download this app and you, you go for a run. For, I found this, I didn't even know about this product until I tried it one time, I went for a run. And I got home, I uploaded the data from my phone to their servers, and it came back, and I got on my computer and looked at it. And it said, you were number 15 from, you're, you're the 15th best in, you know, the, 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 rabbit, the rabbit climb. Like, the, different people give names to different sections of a run. You were, number you were number 14, you're the 14th best time ever on this stretch. You were 25th on this stretch. So now I go back and I go, holy cow, and it shows me the list of people who beat me and when the date, what the date was when they did it. So now I know that this is something that pe other people track all the time. Well, guess what? Next time, I want to be number 13. Next time, I want to be number 11. Next time, I want to be number 8. So now, that competitive spirit comes back because I am competing directly with people who are running in the same trails that I'm running in. Now, that's motivating. That's going to get me off the couch. If I'm thinking about skipping this workout, I might not because now it's a game. It's a contest, and I want to win. So these types of tools are very beneficial for competitive people who just are bored with exercise because it's not competitive. Now it is competitive. Next slide. And you can see that heart rate monitors are kind of the most, no they've been around the longest. Um, and heart rate monitors sales are, last I saw, are a little bit, they're pretty, they're getting, getting to be pretty even with calorie trackers uh, activity monitors like the Fitbit and, and Jawbone and those types of devices. But heart rate monitor sales are going through the roof. They've doubled since 2008. And that's worldwide. So you can just imagine, you can take that same increase and apply it to activity trackers. And you can just see how many of these devices are now out there on the market. Hopefully not too many of them are in the sock drawer. Hopefully a lot of them are being used, at least some small percentage of them are still being used daily or weekly or monthly. Uh, next slide. And you can see it hasn't, had a it hasn't caused a mass exodus in the gym. So here's gym, the number of US health club members. There has not been a mass exodus. So since 2008, when heart rate monitor sales doubled, and that's really about the time that activity monitors started skyrocketing, there's still an increase overall of, US, of health club members in the US. So it's not as many people feared in the gym industry, in the gym world, it's not taking members away. It may, in many cases, be driving people into the gym to get guidance. Next slide. So the marriage of fitness and technology, you have web-based products, like we talked about all the apps that are out there, food logging, exercise trackers that are there, um, home-based, technologies, you have all sorts of technologies that you can use in the home, and then equipment. More and more equipment now, and this is where gyms, they were a little slow, to, not gyms, um, equipment manufacturers were a little slow to the game, but they got on board with the technology and started putting Bluetooth 
into treadmills and putting a, 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 a tablet of some sort, whatever brand they want to use in there, put a tablet in there with Bluetooth, and now when a user comes in who's using a Fitbit, for example, and they take all the steps, they can actually be there and they can see real time on that tablet, on the, on the treadmill, what they just did for the last hour, real time. So they don't have to wait till they get home anymore. Oh, I've only burned 543 calories. My goal was 700 calories. I better keep moving. And it's, it'll show minute by minute how far they're going. So they're starting to tie gym equipment into this technology that's available that our consumers are using. So that's going to help drive consumers into that facility that's using that piece of equipment that works with the device that I wear. So it's really, it's all working together and everything becomes more personalized. No more in the future, we don't have to have these generic recommendations on a treadmill. There's a lot of treadmills, you see this generic, here's your heart rate range zone based on age. Well, is that right for me based on my physical condition? Maybe, but most likely not. So now I wear a heart rate monitor and I come in and I put in my resting heart rate and boom, 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 it tells me exactly what I should be doing. So the gym now, gyms now are catering to people who are using these devices to help, help both. Help the gym be more successful because you're going to stick around and join that gym. And obviously the consumer is going to get better results because of the advantage. Next slide. So fitness and technology is, do you still want to hug or no? No, okay, we'll pass on that. So fitness and technology is actually a match made in heaven, not like a lot of trainers felt in the beginning that it was going to take away business. It's actually driving business. So it's actually working out very well for the consumer and for the fitness industry at, at large. Thank you. Thank you. Now, yeah, so we want, to, uh, we want to use this time to open it up for some questions and uh, help you guys understand a little bit more and maybe get, uh, get you guys uh, Yes. They use a barbell, a squat rack, a bench press, that's it, and then they use a, a pen and paper you know, to record mm -hmm. their lifts, and that's it. That's all they need. How can you reconcile this old school demographic with all this new stuff that they don't trust at all? That's a great question. Uh, really trying to convince the, the more traditional ways that we lift in introducing the newer technologies. And one of the easiest ways I can, I can recommend that is to show them the convenience of it. It's not that you're changing what you're doing, you're just now better at tracking it. If you talk to those people, they'll be the first to admit they write everything down. And they, they, even, they have stuff in their, their dresser drawer from seven years ago. So now they're able to keep it all. It can have 20 years worth of data all in one place. And so it's just much easier to access and say, well, I don't need to bring that journal from 2011. I have it all right here on, on, on the cloud or on my app. So yeah, I think actually that would be a really encouraging thing for a person uh, and they would probably embrace it because it's gonna make it more convenient for them. Yeah, it's a great question. That was our last question. That was our last question.